Welcome. I'm Stephen Katz, a marriage and family therapist, and I am very happy and proud to tell you that I am here today with Dr. Richard Reese. Welcome aboard, Richard. Thank you. So, before we get to the therapy, psychological stuff, where are you from? Well, I usually claim New York. Uh-huh. Uh, That's not true. Well, I was born in Massachusetts and uh -huh. lived from the time I was about two and a half to uh, seven years old in Chicago. Uh-huh. But um, for the rest of my life, I, I lived in New York uh -huh. on Long Island. Long uh, Island. Not Long Island, not far from the city. Uh -huh. um, and remained there for most of my adult life. Is that what made here. you be a shrink? Hmm. What Just made me be a shrink? Just dealing with living in New York? It wasn't that. Uh -huh. I would say that from a very young age, I sort of was excited about being in the world. And I looked around and just it occurred to me that most people did not seem very happy. Uh -huh. And I got real curious about that. This you know, somebody asked me that today. They said, uh, so were you just born happy? Were you just born happy? No. Um, and I wouldn't characterize myself as somebody that is, like, I'm not exuberant and, 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 and stuff like that. I'm really kind of a serious guy most of the time. Uh -huh. uh, but I feel things deeply. Uh -huh. And I, I guess I experience a lot of joy out of existence. Mm-hmm. But in a serious way. But you were saying that you looked around the world and you noticed that there were a lot of people that were not happy. Yeah, and it, it seemed to me that that was really quite curious, that everyone has this phenomenal gift of existing uh -huh. <coughs> with all the many, many gifts that existing offers to be experienced. Uh -huh. And yet people are so caught up in, in, in other things and in stresses and worries. So th that made me be very curious to try to understand what is this business of what's happening with the human soul so was it like you know so you're nine years old and you thought this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then you just did everything it needed to do to become a psychologist i wish it were that simple um i had quite a discernment process deciding if i was actually going to really follow the dream and, and become a psychologist and it uh -huh. actually is not my first career um, uh -huh. so uh, i was working in emergency medical services and New York City for some years. Wow, that must have been pretty intense. It was certainly You intense. were driving around with an ambulance? I was. Wow. And then I was a school teacher for a while. Also in New York? Also in New York, in the inner city, in the South Bronx and wow. uh, South Side Jamaica, Queens, uh -huh. which are potentially rough areas. And some of the kids have a real rough time getting the resources they need uh -huh. to get the education that they should be getting. And, uh, but you know, each of those experiences reminded me every day that I wanted to be a psychologist. So what yeah. was the turning point that made you actually, you know, sign up for the classes that it takes? Yeah. Um, I guess I had finally saved up enough money. <laughs> <laughs> it's expensive. <laughs> to try and apply to grad school. And uh -huh. I also, I applied to graduate school in Hawaii knowing that I wanted to make a life here. What brought you here? Usually it's a woman. Was it a woman? Uh, I, it wasn't a woman that brought me here. Uh -huh. um, I just love the weather uh -huh. and the beauty and the sky. In fact, my last visit back to New York, uh, I had a great time, but I found myself wondering why the sky was so low. I know what you mean. Yeah. And I really just was so grateful to be back here and smell the flowers and hear the birds and, you know, feel the Hawaiian breeze on my face. So what was your first experience in the field here? Or was it not here? Hmm. I mean, in, in psychology. Yeah, I mean, my first job in Hawaii was as a therapist working for an uh, organization called Parents and Children Together doing uh -huh. intensive in-home therapy. And what qualified me for that position was having a master's degree in education. Uh -huh. And I was really... Uh, excited. Oh, and maybe also because I was enrolled in a graduate study program for a doctorate in psychology. That might have helped. So, um, I, but I was thrilled to have that opportunity. And that was the first time I did real therapy that is therapy. What was that like, going into people's homes? 
Yeah, it was a very interesting experience. You know, there are so many different cultures here, and uh, I had had some experience being an outsider already. You know, working in the Bronx and uh -huh. working in in Jamaica. Um, so I was already prepared to come in as an outsider, but there was just so much to learn, including one of my first clients spoke pigeon. Uh huh. And, and you know here. And I understood some of it, but I had to really pay attention. Uh-huh. Um, and... Did you get much hostility uh, being... Surprising, some, yeah, surprisingly no. Oh. And I had heard so many stories. Um, but somehow, I guess I was fortunate to maybe uh, enter those circumstances maybe with the right amount of humility. <laughs> uh-huh. I would guess is maybe part of it. I mean, so you would be there in the living room with the grandma and the grandma and everybody. That's so right. where do you start? You bring in a box of Manapua. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> Make sure you take off your shoes. Uh -huh. um, you know, sometimes it was funny because different houses are different, but you'd see a pile of all these slippers and flip-flops, and then you'd walk in and the floor would just be completely disgusting <laughs> and you'd have to just walk in the floor and uh -huh. not be you know concerned about that wow. you know and eventually you'd start to feel like you were part of that family uh -huh. and when that started to happen often that was when you'd start to see a really good shift happening in the family work what what kind of families I mean what brought you to those families why were you there well I had a job and they would assign me cases and there would be a particular at-risk youth uh -huh. who was identified and oftentimes that youth and that youth's family would be mandated for services. Which means they had to go for what reasons? Because the law required it, because the judge ordered it. Because? Usually because there was some real significant problem, maybe some type of abuse or... Uh, you know, oh, not so necessarily the kids doing drugs or sometimes it was abuse. I mean, all kinds of things that you could imagine. Uh huh. Um, so there were sometimes some very, very intense cases. I even had a couple uh, cases where I was assigned to work with a youth and their foster parents. And in uh, one particular case, uh, she was eventually adopted by the foster parents after months of difficulty. Uh -huh. um, but with the right coaching and the right intentions, I think that we made a really positive impact on, on that kid's life. So where'd you go from there? Yeah, well, I was going to say before, you know, I, I paused when, when you had asked me how I got started in the field because yeah. um, a lot of my work now is around bereavement and loss. Uh -huh. I've done quite a bit of work with the terminally ill, um, hospice psychotherapy and um, palliative work. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not that common for a psychologist to do. And yeah. when I first, my first experience doing that was when I was 19 years old, I was a home health aide, and I was working in hospice in New York City. And I wasn't trying to be a psychologist. It was, you know, feeding, bathing, toileting, cleaning, lifting, addressing the physical comfort needs. Uh, but I developed really significant relationships in that job. And I had conversations that for a 19-year-old were really profound. Mm -hmm. As people are trying to come to some sort of reconciliation with the whole of their life. Yeah. When their life may be ending quite soon. And those conversations impacted the way I saw everything. And reminded me of the nine-year-old me that was so grateful to be alive and so curious as to why everyone was so distracted by the minutia. And uh, many years later, in graduate school for psychology, when I did my doctoral dissertation, uh, the theme was conscious dying. And you might have heard of Ram Das. Mm -hmm. So I, Ram Dass. I did a qualitative case study with one participant in the research, and that one participant was Ram Das. And so I went to his house and I interviewed him, uh, collected all my data over time. Richard Alpert. That's the one. And you interviewed him. Yeah, because, you know, when I was a whippersnapper of 19 years old walking down New York City streets, I used to listen to these cassette tapes of his all about him embracing the aging process and how death is perfectly safe. And 
Uh, so yeah, I wanted to find out, you know, 20 years How later. How did you if get still, permission to interview him? You know, I bumped into him. I, I went to a, I went to a seminar on working with the dying that he attended, and I was hoping to strike up a conversation with him. And then I wasn't sure if I was going to chicken out. And then he pulled his wheelchair right up next to me and sat next to me, and I said to myself, "Okay, he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> I think that I need to, to ask him." And so I did. I invited him. I told him about what I had in mind, and uh, he agreed. Wow. Yeah. How much time did you get to spend with him? Um, I, I'm not quite certain. Uh -huh. um, but it was over time. It was over. Oh, it wasn't just one visit. No, it wasn't just oh, one visit. Oh. So I would say I had several visits with him. Each one would last maybe an hour or an hour and a half. Um, Where was this? On Maui. Yeah. Okay, wow. So I'd fly over to Maui. And, um, and I, it, the process of the dissertation took about two years. So, that's but that's amazing. informed a lot of my work with, uh, with people. Uh, you know, I've done bedside psychotherapy in some of our local hospitals here and um, talking to people about, you know, what's this like for you? You know, many people are greatly relieved to be able to have those conversations because so many people avoid it or mm -hmm. tiptoe around it. And yet, it's really a time when many people don't want to be lonely. They want right. to feel connected. When they're dying. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's a little bit. So I guess I started that job, and I, all my jobs felt a little bit like they were connected to that scene. And vision. so now, what's most of your work? I have um, a portion of my private practice devoted mostly to bereavement uh -huh. and loss. So people grief. who've recently lost somebody. Mm -hmm. And then there's another portion of my work uh, devoted to trauma uh -huh. of various type. And I also work with some folks just on general issues, you know, couples counseling and this sort of thing. Uh -huh. um, and I work as a clinic manager at the UH Center for Cognitive Behavior Therapy. So that's mostly seeing students? Uh, that job is um, mostly managing the clinic, and, and there are some mentorship roles for me with the doctoral candidates and the postdoc. Oh, so you're mentoring people who are seeing students? Mentoring people who are working out in the community with children and adolescents. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, and, but many of those are students themselves. So you'll have a graduate student who's coming close to finishing, and this will be a practicum rotation for them. Uh -huh. And uh, so that's a very nice thing to do to be able to have um, to be able to offer support and in some cases maybe even have some influence over the way that people are practicing psychotherapy or are doing psychological assessment. So the, the bereavement piece, yeah. um, some, when, when somebody loses, uh, if it's somebody really like a husband or a parent or a child, uh, it's such an enormous and sometimes unexpected um, loss. They must be very overwhelmed, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, how do you begin? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Steve, because while it's true that every individual person might come with their own individual circumstances, it appears to be almost universal, in my experience, for people who've suffered a really grave loss to have a period of such overwhelm that they almost can't even think straight. Right. And so some of what is helpful in that kind of a moment is to be very concrete, even sometimes to be a little bit directive and giving people some concrete ideas about something that they can do. I'm going to hold you right there because okay. I just got the magic whisper in my ear. It says, we need to take a break right now, and we'll be right back with part two of Shrink Wrap with Dr. Richard Reese. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes 
uh, twice a month. Depends when we're busy. We get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent health care issues in our state. Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about health care, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Aloha. You can join the Hawaii Farmer Series every Thursday from 4 to 5 on ThinkTech. And I'm your co-host, Matthew Johnson, here with Justine Espirito. And we are so thankful to have this show to use as a forum to get to know all the movers and shakers in agriculture in Hawaii and hear kind of their background in history as well as... Uh, their perspective on what they're doing and also the future for agriculture in Hawaii. So join us every Thursday. You can tweet in your own comments and suggestions and be a part of the conversation at Think Tech High. And we hope to see you every single Thursday. Welcome back to Shrink Wrap. I'm still with my guest, Dr. Richard Reese. And I had just asked you, so somebody comes, they're fresh with a loss, somebody close to them. And you were saying that sometimes they're so stunned uh, that they need some direct direction. Yes, and so often I might start by helping them come up with some um, ideas, some specific ideas about things that they might do. Um, I try to remind them that we naturally know how to heal. Just like if you get a cut and your skin knows how to scab mm. and then heal. Mm. But oftentimes in the modern world we might be so disconnected or so distracted that we do things that might interfere with the healing process. Mm -hmm. And grief and loss seem to come for many people in waves. Right. And the process of healing often takes quite some time and it happens in stages uh, and at the end there is sometimes an interesting gift which is that there's a deepening of one's capacity to love when they've known loss. That must be hard sometimes for people to hear that um, but I like your metaphor about like you get a cut you don't have to think about it the body heals um, but um, when you're so overwhelmed with a loss that just happened, uh, I think it, it's probably great to hear that you don't really have to do anything that you will heal because that's part of what human beings do because sometimes you feel like I'm never going to get over this. Yeah that there is no way I'm going to fill that hole that this person just left in my life. Mm -hmm. And in some way, there's some truth to that because you're forever changed after a loss. And so, and I think this is true for a lot of what psychotherapy is or can be uh, in many cases that we experience things that are difficult and then how do you grow to be able to still cherish your life, to still be able to function and feel productive in your life, to still be able to connect with others and feel appreciated and seen and have those in your life feel that way when they interact with you? And all of those things can be disrupted during a profound loss. Yeah, I mean, also your sense of trust in the world. Especially if it's, an, if it's somebody who is on the younger side. Right, and that's, that's definitely the line where I see in my work where the, the loss and the trauma sort of intersect. Yeah. And that both are like world-changing experiences often. And um, there are more than one direction to go in response to that and uh, one can remain very wounded or one can uh, open their heart and develop wisdom and grow. So I'm assuming you want to help that person do the latter. 
yes. uh, grow rather than remain forever wounded, which some people do, uh, how do you facilitate that? Well, there might be lots of different specific ways. Um, I often rely on a lot of emotion-focused therapy techniques, which what is, is it's, it takes, um, it sort of starts from a base of a very Rogerian uh, client-centered approach, and then it... Wait, wait, we have some people might not know what Rogerian means. So Carl Rogers was a, a, a psychologist uh -huh. um, in history who was known for being uh, very, uh, it, he called it unconditional positive regard. Mm -hmm. He was very loving and accepting of his clients and uh, also was very authentic in his interactions with them. And so emotion-focused therapy has a base of some client-centered approach uh, elements, and then it also relies a lot on Gestalt. Uh -huh. And Gestalt is from another uh, theorist of psychological history. Um, that uses a lot of uh, being in the present moment. Mm -hmm. uh, they might uh, do things that they call experiments, which are almost like little games of self-exploration, except me, these can games you give me an are- example? Sure. Um, these games are very serious business, uh -huh, however. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, but so, for example, um, a very common one people might have seen is uh, doing what they call two-chair work. And this is where if I'm speaking to you and you're talking to me about some ambivalence you're having in your life, mm -hmm. maybe you kind of want to do this and you kind of don't want to do this at the same time. I want to leave, I want to stay. <laughs> then I'll invite you to sit in one chair and talk about mm -hmm. all the ways you want to leave. And then I'll have you sit in the other chair and talk about all the ways you want to stay. And what it does is it does a lot of clarifying. Mm. Oftentimes, ultimately the, goal, ultimately, the goal is to reintegrate those disparate parts Bring of the yourself. Parts, you know. yeah. So I, I might rely on emotion-focused therapy um, to deepen one's felt sense experience of what they're feeling first. And then to... Um, so, so somebody's obviously, if they're grieving, they're feeling very sad. Well, it's not always so obvious. Ah. So, you know, you might discover that the sadness is the appropriate reaction, but as you work a little bit together, there's maybe anger. Mm. Maybe there's anger at the self. Maybe there's anger at the person who died, and then that's a little right. more tricky to get to and very much worthwhile working through. I'm thinking of a kid um, who lost a parent, and um, like you said, sometimes it isn't so obvious. Mm -hmm. The kid is playing games, you know, doing a puzzle. Oh, if that kid came to you, how would you work with that kid? Do you work with kids sometimes? I do. Um, you know, I don't have enough information on that particular kid in, in, our, in our hypothetical scenario here to know. Yeah. But my plan would be to show up and be very present with the child and to see what the child wishes to talk about, mm -hmm. uh, to be very honest. I find that um, adults in our society are very frequently not honest with children mm. and often don't trust them enough and don't necessarily know their depth. Yeah. And I would investigate. Uh -huh. I would investigate for the depth of that child and try to really meet that child where that child was, not based on assumptions because of something like age. Right, right, right. And all kids are different, right? Yeah. Some 10-year-olds are very different than other mm -hmm. ones. Now, at the end of a process of doing bereavement work with someone, what we tend to see is the turning of a new chapter. And it's not like the pain is not always there. It's not like you're not forever changed right. from a profound loss. But what happens is it's almost like you have permission to start a fresh new life in a different way. Uh, and, as I mentioned before, sometimes having had the loss prepares you to be incredibly conscious and loving towards those in your life. And that's perhaps one of the most important things we can learn in living. So here we are on this earth, and we know that we're alive, and we know that we're going to die. But we pretend a lot that we're not. Sure. It seems to me that it might be worthwhile to truly and deeply experience our relationships with others while we're here mm. and to love and to open our hearts while we're here 
to appreciate our experiences and at the same time to be disciplined enough to know that you must let it all go eventually because those people are going to die and you're going to die yeah which is not to bring in anything metaphysical there are many people that have all kinds of ideas about afterlife and other realms and and things like that and uh is there a place for your own beliefs when you're doing counseling? You know, it's, they get put in a pocket, especially if I'm doing end-of-life work with someone. Do you someone. think it's possible to do that, to put it away, put your own beliefs away totally? I mean, it, I've experienced it, and, and I don't know quite how to explain it. But when I'm there and I'm holding the hand of a bedridden man mm -hmm. who is deeply Catholic, uh -huh. It's really easy for me to start to feel really Catholic. <laughs> is, that, is that authentic? Yeah. And so it's almost like I'm borrowing someone's perception of the world temporarily. And it's very important for my patient who happens to be, she's a neuroscientist or a physicist or something. Maybe she's an atheist. I'm perfectly comfortable being in that room with her and discussing her cosmology that when she dies, it's just going to be the end. And it's all just science and matter. And as far as I'm concerned, everybody has the right to define for themselves what they make of their world. And, uh, and I'm very comfortable learning from them in a humble way, learning from them about their view of everything. And I don't spend any time trying to convince them otherwise. I don't have an agenda. Mm -hmm. I'm not saving souls. Mm -hmm. I'm just being present and not being afraid of the pain or the loss or, or you know, I'm just being open. Which is not to say that I don't have some of my own beliefs about things, but even then, uh, beliefs are not the same to me as that which I feel I know. Uh, and so I have a lot of things like they're plausible hypotheses about what might be the ultimate answers yeah, I was mean, uh, just thinking, I had a family uh, see me this week, and right at the end, as she was leaving, they were very religious Christians, and the mom, as she was leaving, she smiled at me, and she said, so now are you a believer? <laughs> and I just smiled, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to say that I become instantly a convert, um, and I, I, I just said to myself that, that it made her feel good to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, that's fine that yeah. she did that. Right, and I think having that flexibility in clinical work in the art and science of psychotherapy is kind of important because you're not trying to be clergy. No, you know? that would be dishonest. Right, and so, and for me, it's often very, I, I'm, I've always been quite interested in religions, mm -hmm. and I've studied quite a bit. Um, and I can really get into a lot of the different explanations of for, why we for our, yeah. <laughs> why we die, uh -huh. where we go. Uh, and what's moral to do or not to do, uh -huh. and how the earth was created. And yeah. you know, those are the things that typically religions explore. I find that stuff just fascinating. And I find that there are things, there are truisms in all of them um, that teach us something about, that might be of value for life wisdom. With that, we're going to take our second break and we'll be back right afterwards with the final segment of this week's Shrink Wrap. We'll be right back. Don't touch that dial. To uh, Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Wednesday. And we have Sharon Moriwaki, my co host and co chair of the uh, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And we have War Warren Bollmeyer today, a special guest with the Hawaii Renewable Energy Alliance and also a member of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. In fact, he's our Renewable Energy Working Group chair. So he, he is. Takes care he is. Of all of us. You ought to see him in song and dance, too. <laughs> <laughs> he does the musical part of the show. Uh, Sharon is more serious than that, but not much more not serious. Much more. <laughs> So anyway, what do you think of this show? I mean, is this good? I think this is good. We hope it's good. We hope it attracts a lot more people than, than our forum so that people can see what's going on in energy and clean energy 
and uh, and and call in, write in, tweet yeah, or we Twitter. Yeah, we want that. We want uh, we want public engagement, civic engagement, for everybody, because that's the only way we're going to get down the road on this, right, Warren? Yeah, I think so, and it's an opportunity for guys um, like me to share a little bit of their mana and and uh, sometimes get the facts right. Who was that guy that said, just give me the facts, you know, start with the facts and then work from there? Oh, it was Dragnet guy, right? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jack that was I was just, yeah, a, I was just I in grade school then. I barely that. remember that. Just the facts, man. man. <laughs> Here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, <laughs> every Wednesday from 4 to 5. You'll see. Come back soon. Right, Sharon? Great. Right, Uh Yes. <laughs> Welcome back to Shrink Wrap. Hawaii. I'm with my guest, Dr. Richard Reese. So in the beginning, you said a good portion of your work is about working with people who have experienced since, <laughs> blah, blah, experienced tra tra trauma. That's right. <laughs> that was not a joke. Yes. Um, I, uh, I was in emergency medical services. So you saw a some, lot of physical trauma. Yes. And that always nudged at me in a certain kind of way. I wanted to know how to be and how to help other people be strong in those kinds of crisis moments. And I would say that aside from, you know, stopping someone's bleeding or setting a bone, the, the really memorable moments were often just being of comfort to someone. You'd show up and just you being there was like, oh, okay, someone's here to the rescue. Right, you know? right. And, uh, and I, I thought that there was something about that, that if we can be there for one another around issues or experiences that are traumatic, that's a tremendous gift. If you've been on the other end of that, you certainly would know it. Um, yes, I remember when uh, losing my mom, a hospice worker came to be there. And it, uh, I'll never forget, she was wonderful. Yeah. But I didn't want to steer you away from sure. so, the trauma. Well, so I, um, I worked for some time as an assessment clinician for the National Center for PTSD, and then I did, um, I did an internship training uh, at the VA hospital, Pacific Islands Healthcare Division here. Spent some years working at Triple R Army Medical Center. I worked at a, a Queens Hospital as well, uh, and in all of those experiences, I had a lot of opportunity to um, interact with with clients that had experienced one type of trauma or another. So you mentioned the military experience. Um, here in Hawaii, there's a, every branch of the military is here. Yeah. And uh, because of all the wars that we've been through in the last 20 years, um, there's a lot of PTSD. Have you seen a lot of that? Yeah. And I would say combat trauma is often a very, very specific type of, of um, trigger for PTSD because there are often complex factors. Uh, you get a, perhaps a young soldier, they've been trained in a certain kind of way, they're dropped off in a place, there's a sense of maybe fear for one's own life, right, right. certainly fear for one's buddies. Right. Um, there might be moments where one doesn't know what to do and then you look down and you see you're holding a firearm and well what what do you do and then so uh, many of the experiences that I helped uh, people work through involved uh, things that they failed to do things that they did that they regretted uh, guilty feelings over being someone who made it when someone else didn't make it mm -hmm. and and these are all uh, connected to the way we define our world and so many times a person with post-traumatic stress disorder uh, of that kind feels deeply betrayed whether it's by the military or by the US government or by their God or by the universe <laughs> you know this sense that uh, once the world was safe and now it absolutely isn't safe and in fact I'm not even sure if I'm good or evil and That's a so, lot. yeah, and then from that to um, in my hospital work, I had trauma cases where it might just be a, a we had a, a vacationing visitor from another country who was driving around on vacation. It was an, a terrible car accident where the vehicle was T-boned, and he woke up with broken bones all over his body, and his wife and son had been killed, and he can barely 
communicate with these other people because his English is, you know, English for travelers. Uh, and so much of my work with him was, you know, we had um, services where we had, um, um, not translation, but uh, interpreters mm -hmm. through the computer. So I was able to, to talk with him. Um, but essentially, it was really about uh, how is this that my whole life has, like, he had saved up for many years for this trip to Hawaii. He wasn't a wealthy person. Uh, he had a blue collar job. Came out to Hawaii with his wife and son to really celebrate after years of working, and then his whole life was, you know, irretrievably altered. And how does one find strength to go forward from there? You know, and yeah. So my goal in that now that's not PTSD yet, right? Because it's right after the trauma. <laughs> PTSD happens after a month, let's say, if mm -hmm. it's going to happen. Um, but even right in the aftermath of a trauma, you can sometimes get in there and just be a person who is present with that person and says, you know, well, here you are. What's next? And let's talk. What, what are your values? What does life mean to you? And how can we have courage in this terrible situation? But I mean, it doesn't really sound like to me there are answers to these questions. I mean, as a therapist, what, you know, yeah. What can you do really besides be a really good listener? Yeah, that's right. Um, you, got, you got a good point there because sometimes it's not very clear what the answers are. And so you just be really present and you be really authentic. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the last thing in the world, if I lo lose my family in a car accident, I don't really want to hear everything's going to be all right. No, you certainly don't. Because everything is not all right. But you might appreciate someone coming in and sitting with you and playing some music and telling you, I see your pain, I'm here. I, I wish I could take your pain away. Yeah. All I can do is be here. Yeah. And so, and that's one of the things that I think it's very important for psychologists and other clinicians in the healing arts needs to know. Um, you can't carry your patient's burdens for them. Right. You can walk down the path next to them right but you wouldn't even want to carry their burden for them that's for them yeah uh, you wouldn't want to take away their their resiliency and their strength uh-huh so with with great respect you just go and you be so all right so moving away from that yeah. you know sudden impact thing mm -hmm. it just happened like let's say that the soldier who has uh, you know seen buddies blown up by these uh, IEDs on the road multiple times. And, um, and now every time there's a big bang, he, you know, freaks out or he can't sleep at night or he's gotten paranoid and his relationship is down the tubes because he can't trust anybody. Maybe he's self-medicating with drugs back home here because he doesn't know how to be normal anymore because like, his normal now is craziness from being over there. So just the uh, just peaceful situations freak him out. Yeah. So um, in my training, I was uh, certified in several uh, what the U.S. government calls gold standard techniques for PTSD treatment. Um, one is prolonged exposure, or PE. And what is that? Uh, that uh, combines uh, relaxation techniques uh -huh. with um, imagining very vividly the experience of the trauma. Bringing them back to where that happened, when that happened. In, in their, their imagination. Head. Right. And then rating their level of distress and working like on... One from one to ten, how uh -huh. do you feel? And then working to, to reduce that. And it's basically looked at as an exposure-based technique. You just do that again and again until it goes down. Uh -huh. Hopefully. But it's also paired with, uh, s s there's things built in there where there are some tools for self-soothing and things like that. Yeah, I would but think it's a little risky because they could just, it could make them worse. And you don't want to just jump really quickly into it. There have been talks of, you know, re-traumatization, although yeah. I think the literature is pretty clear on the fact that that's not really something that seems to be happening in the, in the trials that uh -huh. looked at PE. But um, it's really important to build rapport. It's really important to build a sense of safety in that office. It's really important to get clear with the client 
this is what we're going to do. This has a real purpose. This is a time limited thing that we're doing. It's not going to go on forever. And it has a real purpose. And the purpose is to help you arrive home because you have not arrived home yet. If you mean in their head. Right. Uh, and then there's cognitive processing therapy, and that uses a much more conversational aspect. And there's EMDR, which you may have heard of. That's I'm, with the pencil. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So those are some uh, techniques. Just that, for people out there, what does EMDR stand for? You remember? Uh, eye movement, uh, <laughs> desensitization, and, and uh, reprocessing. Uh, so by following, doing things with their eyes, what's the theory? So there's no theory about the mechanism of action for EMDR. They just know it works. If pressed, it sounds like magic. But yes, <laughs> they just know that it works. And so different modalities of trauma treatment work better for different specific cases. And sometimes I'll spend a good amount of time trying to figure out that. And uh, there are other things like um, the TFT, which is the thought freedom technique. That's the tapping thing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have used that with patients as well. And uh, they're getting some really good um, support in the literature with the studies going on in Rwanda with uh, refugees. Yes, we had a lady on a show who, uh, uh, Ann Yabasaki, uh -huh. uh, who she's one of those people that went to Rwanda, worked with the traumatized mm -hmm. child soldiers, mm -hmm. and had amazing results. Yeah. And they even came back here and trained me where I was working with uh, women with addiction issues here. Great. And that was pretty amazing. And isn't it amazing how well it works? It's totally amazing, and these kids were for real. Yeah. They, they were for real. These were kids that couldn't talk. They were so traumatized, they were mute from being handed, you know, AR-15s as little kids and shooting people, fam families, and killing villages so that they couldn't talk anymore. And then they came here after doing this process, something that they didn't believe in, they never heard of, and they sang for me. Wonderful. And they trained me how to do the TFT. And so isn't it phenomenal how resilient human beings are capable of being? It's, it's yeah, miraculous. Yeah. So if I don't use one of those techniques, or maybe after using one of those techniques, I feel that my job is not necessarily done. So let's say you come in and we've really reduced your symptoms of hypervigilance. Hyper right. We've really reduced your arousal. You've stopped avoiding things the way you used to. You're starting right. to feel whole again. Yeah. A again, not back to how you were before. Again, you, this has to be an experience where you've grown. Uh huh. You've gained in wisdom. You've lost your innocence once you've lost your innocence. Right. But you can gain wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you can love the world. You can cherish your life. You can get back to being someone that feels whole and authentic. So is it similar techniques for um, somebody who, say, has been physically abused as a child, and uh, now they're a grown-up, and um, they have some of the PTSD-like symptoms. Maybe they can't be in a crowd, or uh, they were bullied on the way to school. So now, like, taking their kids to school, freaks them out what mm -hmm. what do you do is it similar stuff so you know it would sound similar if I was to name a technique for yeah. example but there are certain specific things that would look very different and we know that in cases of what are often referred to as complex PTSD uh -huh. uh, there are some differences in the response to some of the treatments that have been studied a lot and oftentimes uh, I think that it's helpful to try to well, in the case that you gave, mm -hmm. uh, fear of being in crowds or having a problem with driving, you might treat that really with exposure techniques in terms uh -huh. of a symptom reduction technique. Right. But there's this larger picture about how do they define their life? What does, is this a mean world? Mm -hmm. Is this a world where they're repeatedly victimized? Uh -huh. You know, and how do we make the ending of the movie a good close? Which brings us to our close. Okay. <laughs> I've just been told in my ear. Uh, we've been talking to Dr. Richard Reese, a clinical psychologist here in Hawaii. And if you would like to see Dr. Reese or myself, uh, get in touch with me. And this is Stephen Katz, and you've been watching Shrink Wrap Hawaii. Have a great day. Bye. <laughs>